they are president and the vice president. And out of the millions of Kenyans who turned up, 7.2 million Kenyans decided willingly that Dr. William Bruto should be elected as president and regard the Gashamba as elected president. I think it's fair when members of parliament decide that they want to move the deputy president from office. As deputy president, he is his side of the story. I think it's very fair. And I thought it's also respectful ability to hear from me before the other members because they are the ones who elected me to office. Article 1 of the Kenya Constitution says that the power and the sovereignty of this great nation rests with the people. The Parliament, that is the National Assembly and the Senate, enjoy the delegated authority from the people. It is therefore very important that the people who elected me as deputy president get my response of the very outrageous accusations against their deputy president that have no basis, that is sheer propaganda, that is a scheme to hold me out of office because of other political considerations and has nothing to do with violation of the constitution. It has nothing to do with gross misconduct and it has absolutely nothing to do with committing international or national crimes. The people of Kenya are therefore entitled by right to hear from their deputy president what is his response to those outrageous allegations. Again, an attempt to do a public, uh, public participation in a very short exercise that was done. My response was not part of what was presented to the people of Kenya. The people of Kenya were being asked to give their views as to whether the deputy president should be impeached from office and the accusations were attached but in a highly legalistic language beyond the comprehension of many Kenyans. But the response of the deputy president was not there to enable them to make an informed decision by listening to the charges against him and listening to his response. Because the rules of natural justice demand that no man should be condemned and hurt. My lawyers will be vigorously be challenging that uh, public participation as a nullity and that does not meet the threshold of public participation as expounded by the Supreme Court of Kenya during the celebrated case of Governor Peter Wabora. Uh, the motion alleges that two years since assuming office, Rigadi Gashagwa has acquired property and wealth whose estimate value is 5.2 billion, despite his known income by way of employment is 24 million. This is extremely outrageous. Honorable Mutuse goes ahead to give properties that he alleges are owned by one Regadi Gashagwa. I trust he was just given a document to sign. Had he taken some bit of time to do some research, he would not embarrass himself and the National Assembly. James Dorito Gashagua was the governor of Nyeri and died in London on the 24th of February 2017 and he was truly Gashagua was by his bedside. Prior to his death, three or four weeks before, in privacy, he wrote his will and appointed Rigadi Gashagwa as an executor of that will, jointly with Mwai Madenge, his close time buddy, who is a quantity surveyor, and celebrated lawyer, 
The three of us were tasked to manage his estate. In the will, you'll be given a copy. He did put his properties and assets and cash and anything that he owned in this world. And among the things that he did put was the Olive Garden Hotel, the Thing of Beach Resort, the Queen's Gate apart Apartment, and Langata High Rise Flats. It is these four properties that the Honorable Mutuse alleges in the National Assembly that Regadi Gashagua has acquired them after becoming deputy president in 2022 when Drito Gashagua died in 2017. It is the most embarrassing allegation a member of parliament can table before the National Assembly. Those properties were constructed and were in operation when the late Gachagua was alive. I take this opportunity to ask for forgiveness to my late brother, James Derito Gachagua, that today, as your younger brother defends himself, he'll defile your privacy by distributing your will that you wrote in privacy that your properties that you worked so hard for many years to benefit your wives and children are now a subject of discussion and are alleged to be proceeds of corruption. How unfair, how cruel can you be to a dead man? A man who worked so hard, a man who gave his life for his family, to buy plots, to construct property, and leave them in his death for his children and his brothers and sisters. And then you go to the floor of the house and allege that those properties are production of corruption. My dear brother, Rest in peace and forgive me for having joined politics. Because were it not for politics, you would not suffer this shame. Your children are crestfallen as they see their properties being splashed in newspapers as proceeds of crime. The Olive Garden Hotel that is alleged to have been brought by Rigadi Gachagua belongs to the estate of the late James Derito Gachagua. And in his will, he directed that we sell all his properties and divide the proceeds among his brothers, sisters, wives, and children. We, as the executors of his estate, and I want to pay tribute to lawyer Joroge Regero and Mwai Madenge for their commitment and sacrifice to the Gachagua family, many executors who have been given properties to run by deceased people end up misusing them and depriving the beneficiaries. These two great men and myself, because my brother knew I'm an honest man and a fair person, and he knew his family, would never suffer in my hands. We were able to sell Olive Garden Hotel at 412 million and distributed the proceeds to the beneficiaries as directed in his will. We registered his will in the High Court of Kenya and were given the profit. And my late brother, in his wisdom, left regarding Ashagwa 5% of his wealth. I was therefore able to get 20 million shillings from this sale. That is money that is in my account that again I'm told they are proceeds of crime. 
he left my mother 5% of his wealth another 20 million shillings and since my mother is dead my little brother because he trusted me had put in his will that I hold my mother's shares in trust so that is another 20 million shillings in my account again my little brother left me another 4% hold in trust of the children who is deceased the late Dr. Friend Washira Gashagwa whose children are in South Africa and another 16 million shillings was put in my account my late brother gave 2% to my wife Pastor Dalkas because of her kindness of looking after him when he was ill. All this money that has come to me from a dead brother, I'm being told a proceeds of crime. Um, Queen's, Gate, Queen's Gate Service Apartments, another property belonging to the late Kashagwa. It's another property that I'm told I've bought us when I'm dead on the beach. I remember with nostalgia that he used to host us there every Christmas to enjoy ourselves. This property belongs to the estate of the deceased because ourselves have a family. We want to retain it for sentimental value so that when we visit there, we remember him. Say so again, goes to the in a very emotional manner, quoting the Bible, says that this property has been bought corruptly by the deputy president without knowing where the money has come from. I have seen some land, Rogoro Kiamariga, to start with, Rogoru Kiamariga is not in Madeira East constituency. It is in Madeira West constituency. In haste to dispose of the deputy president because of political deceit and conmanship and betrayal, they could not even get it right where the land is treated. They were in such a haste to get rid of the deputy president. The land is Ruguru stroke Kiamariga, 1223, in Madeira West constituency. It's a two-acre piece of land. It's alleged that it has a helipad. It's a lie. The land is too. And I have planted napier grass for my dairy unit. I bought it at 3.5 million shillings. Again, from my dairy farm. I have a dairy farm. To the Honorable Jiroge Wainaina, the MP for Kenny, signed the notice of motion to impeach me on the allegations, this one being among them. Had there been no malice, Joroge Wainaina, the Honorable MP for Kenny, would have advised the Honorable Mutuse that he sold me this land in the year 2015. I have a sale agreement I'll give you with this picture. I bought this land from the Honorable Joroge Wainaina in 2015. I was not even a member of parliament. Yet he has appended his signature that I should be impeached and go home for having corruptly bought 40 acres of land in Kakuret. In fact, the land is not 40 acres, it's actually 35. The allegation is that it's 40 acres, but that land is 35 acres. The people of Kakuret know it. I bought it from the Honorable MP for Kenny, and had he read this motion, I'm sure you would not have signed it. But as you all know, there was a lot of coercion. 
there was a lot of intimidation. And I'm sorry that I'm told the Honorable Inaina is admitted in hospital because of threats, coercion. He's being forced to hang a brother against his will and his conscience. These are the lies that Mutuse brought to the National Assembly and asking the people of Kenya to get rid of the Deputy President of the Republic of Kenya based on lies. I have seen another ridiculous allegation. The Honorable Rigadi Gashagwa, Deputy President of the Republic, has since becoming Deputy President, acquired eight acres of land in Meru. That is false. What is true is that the Deputy President is a, manger, is a member of Solution Circle Limited in Meru. And for those who do not know, the Deputy President is half Meru, half Kikuyu. His mother, the late mother Kirigo Kashagwa, was born in Meru in a place called Katheri, and thereafter settled in Kiberesha. Deputy President Rikati Kashagwa sometimes is a lonely man. His father is dead, his mother is dead. His brother, Derito Kashagwa, the governor, died of pancreatic cancer. His brother, Dr. Fred Wachira Kashagwa, died because of alcohol. His other brother, Jackson Rian, died because of alcohol. His sisters are married. So when he goes home, many times he's lonely. And he decided to look for some land in Meru where he can go and build a house and be among his relatives, his mother's relatives. And in the process, I identified a 29 acre land and borrowed money from Solution Circle, which I'm paying every month. We'll give you documents to show you that this is 29 acres, not eight acres, that I've bought from a loan that I have taken as a member of Solution Circle in Meru the land of my mother, and which I call home. I have seen an allegation that I have a dairy farm in Nyandarwa. I don't have a single animal in Nyandarwa. I have some little land in a place called Shamata, but I'm yet to do anything about it. I think I just mentioned it to one of the, the member of parliament for that area called Gashagwa, that I would like to start a dairy farm. And I think in those rumors in parliament, <laughs> The Honorable Mutuse went ahead to say that I own a dairy farm in Nyandaro. I own no such farm today, but God willing, because of the good climate in Daragua in Shamata, one day, God willing, I'll have a huge dairy farm. I have seen companies listed just to create an impression that the Gadiga Shagwa is doing business. I want the people of Kenya to know that Regadi Shagwa was a businessman before he became a politician. And he had a life. And that life is part of his history. So getting companies that were associated with him 15 years ago, 13 years ago, 10 years ago and publishing them. It's just being mischievous. My life did not start as deputy president. I left university in 1989 and served the public for 15 years up to the year 2002. I left for the private sector for another 15 years. In those 15 years, I was a very astute businessman. And luckily for me, maybe of you who are not that lucky, it was during the Kibaki era when things were working. The economy was strong, business environment was right, and there was room to make money. 
and I made money that time. Those are old companies, and they are not trading. And when I became deputy president, a few companies that own properties, I transferred to my children, and I told them to continue doing business and not to do business with the government because I don't want conflict of interest. I want to confirm to the people of Kenya tonight that none, no company owned by my children has ever done business with the government, and I'm demanding for proof from the Honorable Mutuse or anybody else linking the Gashagua, the Regadi Gashagua family with business deals with the Kenya government. I agreed with my children that they do business with the private sector, do farming, and run the family business that I bequeath them. These companies are all listed and just for the for clarity, because I don't think they are worth a reply. Because there is nothing about them. Regarding the Shagwa Foundation, as a member of parliament, I was educating orphans. I was educating children of single mothers. I was educating children of PWDs. And the education needed to continue. And I don't have the benefit of CDF money. So I started a foundation, the Regadi Gashagwa Foundation, to continue doing the work of charity. I have seen my foundation here. The Honorable Mutuse has not said what crime the Deputy President has done by having a foundation that is non-profit making. For the purposes of clarity, I'll give you the bank statement for this foundation. I have only received a total of 12 million shillings from well wishers, which I have educated children, I have educated students at Pwani University, and other venerable people. Dokas regarding the Shkugo Foundation, this is just an attempt to bring my family into mud. Every Kenyan know the work Dokas Rigadi has done in this country for the boy child. She has opened clinics for addicted children and she gets a lot of money in her foundation. Since a decision was made that the government will not fund the office or the spouse of the deputy president, Kenyans of good will flock to her every day with cash donations, with material donations for her to continue with a very good program she's doing of rehabilitating children in Kilifi, in Mombasa, in Nyandarwa, in Laikipia, in Nairobi, and her work is well documented. I am here to see from the mover of this motion what crime the Dokas Gadi Shagwa Foundation has done. There is no allegation, there is no evidence, there is nothing. Against the Gadi Shagwa Foundation, there is nothing. Spiritway Limited is a company registered by Dokas Rigadi that does work with the church ministries. This ministry has not traded, does not even have a bank account. It's some strong women of God who have come together to create a company around their issues. To preach the gospel. The mover of this motion has not indicated at all what crime this company has committed other than dragging the name of my wife into mud in the National Assembly. Calvary Creed International Limited, as the name suggests, is a company founded by my wife in 2015, long before I became a deputy president. Again, on evangelism and activities to do with the Church of Christ. I have not seen a single allegation against this company. Mothers of the Lord Limited. Again, this is a company incorporated my wife, Pastor Docas, in 2021 with our friends. It has never traded. It does not even have a bank account. 
the Anani Collective. This is a business name registered my son, Dr. Keith Rigadi, in 2021 before I came into office. And I have asked him and he has told me the ideas he had, they have not yet come to fruition. So the company is dormant. I am where to see a single allegation against this company by this young man. Grad Pass Apartments Limited is a company that the executors of the late Gashagua put together to manage Langata View Apartments. The late Gashagua left 80 apartments for his children in Langata and asked us to sell and distribute the proceeds to the wives, the children, and the brothers in a formula that he gave. In a family meeting that I chaired, we agreed as a family that we should not sell the flats. We should share them so that everybody can be getting a rental income. In that formula, because of the shares he gave to me, I have 10 flats. His daughter has 10, his wife has five, another one has two, another has was one. So we did put this company together called Grand Bypass Apartments Limited. This is a company that will be managing those flats on behalf of the beneficiaries of the estate of the late Gashago. Again, this company has been put here by the Honorable Mutuse as a company that is involved in corruption. A company set to manage flats belonging to a dead good man who had foresight to think about the future of his children. And in his death, he is being haunted on nonsensical allegations simply because a decision has been made that Rigadi Gashagwa is no longer useful to this administration. He is a spent cartridge. His work was to help fight Uhuru Kenyatta and get President William Ruto to power. And thereafter, he is of no use, so he should be dispensed with, and somebody else can be appointed. Again, it's the will of the Kenyan people. That is the viciousness that we are even fighting the dead. How cruel can we be? How insensitive can we be? What is this power thing that you even fight the dead for you to entrench yourself in power and get rid of your perceived political enemies? I appeal to the people of Kenya to have respect for the dead, if nothing else. People may have money, they may have power, they may have everything, but they must remember that it is very respectful to respect the dead. Please stop haunting my late brother. Don't put him on trial. He committed no crime by working hard and leaving an inheritance for his children and entrusting his brother, Rikadi Gashagua, to look after that property. Forties Viz Group Limited is a company incorporated in 2023 by my son, Kevin and Dr. Keith, again, some two very enterprising young men. This company has not even taken off. They are still figuring out what business they can do. And before they can even settle down, their father is under siege. So they have to come here every day to keep me company and find out what is not happening. This company has not even started. These are young people, children. Why do you want to destroy their future? By putting their names in the press 
with negativity because you want to destroy their father. These are innocent boys who have decided to invest in their own country. Why do you want to destroy them? You can destroy the Gadi Geshagwa. Fair enough, he has lived for 59 years. But these boys, hardly 30 years, why do you want to destroy them? Pioneer Medical Company Group, I founded this company in the year 2008. It has not done business for the last 10 years. Why are you bringing it to Parliament? Rido Furniture Mart Limited, I founded this company with my wife, Pastor Dorcas, in the year 1999. We used to sell furniture at the roundabout at Bomas on your Itorongai. And we built this company from scratch. And it's been in existence for years. And when we stopped trading with it, we put up apartments in Rongai called Rido Plaza that are managed by this company. We collect rent. We have, uh, I think, 40, 50 flats there and pay tax every month. What wrong has Rido Furniture Mart done? Rido Plaza was constructed in 2012, 10 years before the guy became deputy president. Even if you want to kill this man and make sure he's totally destroyed, why don't you pursue him for the two years he has been in office? Why do you want to go back 20 years before he became deputy president, became deputy president and criminalize his enterprise and his hard work? BioVet Kenya Limited is a company, again, I founded in 2009. Many years before I even went to Parliament, it has not done business for the last 15 years. Not a single shred of evidence that this company has done wrong. It's not there. Morani Manufacturers Limited is a company that is founded by a character from our village and sold some shares to my wife and my children and interested them in manufacturing feeds for pigs and for chicken. It never even took off. This company has never traded in government. It has not done any business. It is actually dormant. I'm told the account has only 132,000 shillings. And you want to set the Deputy President of the Republic of Kenya, a man elected by 7.2 million Kenya shillings because his wife and children have some shares in a company that has 132,000 shillings. Surely. Delta Merchants Limited is a company I founded in 2009 during the Quebec era. It has not done business for 15 years. We demand that you see what this company has done. Wamunyoro Investments Limited is a company named after my village in Wamunyoro which I founded in the year 2001 as a construction company. This company owns a lot of property that I bought in those years when the economy of this country was on south footing. Since I became deputy president, we ceased all activities of this company. It has not done a single transaction with anybody. The company is dormant, but it owns property. Those properties were bought and acquired long before I became deputy president. Cosme Venture Limited is a company that was incorporated in 2018 before I became deputy president by my sons. They do what you call bulk SMS. I used to give them work when I was member of parliament to send messages to my constituents. I think they were charging me 30 cents per SMS. Some young, enterprising young people. 
company 2018. It doesn't do business with government. It is not accused of any wrongdoing by anybody, anywhere. It's just putting the name there. Royal Crimson Ventures Limited, again, incorporated in 2018 by my children to do their little business. No allegation of any wrongdoing has been annexed to the motion. Cruito Properties Limited, again, this is a company that me and the co-executors put together for the purposes of managing uh, the Vipingo Hotel. No details of any acquisition, any wrongdoing, nothing. Crystal Kenya Limited, this company I founded in 2009, and when I became deputy president, I gave out my shares to my children, and my, myself and my wife, we got out and asked them to continue doing business. My two children, like their father, are very enterprising. Nyeri County, where I come from, we were hit badly by COVID, and all our hotels shut down. Hundreds of jobs were lost. Many people who were supplying to those hotels shut down. The two most important hotels in Nyeri is the Outspan Hotel and the Treetops Hotel, and they are always run together. The Outspan Hotel was for sale, and my children were interested, and I encouraged them. Treetops Hotel cannot be sold. It belongs to KWS. It's a government hotel. You can only lease. And the person who owned Outspan Hotel had also leased the Treetops Hotel. So my son acquired Outspan Hotel and got an assignment of the lease. So they don't own Treetops Hotel. It's on a lease from KWS to Abadea Safari, then an easement to Crystal Kenya that is run by my children. I shouldn't be here talking about Crystal Kenya Limited and my children because they are not part of this proceeding. But they have no other forum to defend themselves, so I have to defend them. They are grown-ups. They should defend themselves, but they don't have the forum. They went to a bank and borrowed 600 million. The documents are there. And bought a hotel. And bought the lease. And I publicly announced that my family has acquired the two hotels because there was nothing to hide. I saw no need to advise my children, like other people do, to buy the properties through proxy because this was street business. They went and borrowed 600 million from the bank. And they were given one year moratorium, which is not over, to do the renovations and all that and open the facility. But I want to thank my son, Dr. Keith Rigadi. He worked very hard. That I think last month or so, I was at the treetops with the British High Commissioner to open the treetops. The treetops is so important to the people of Nyeri and the Abadea ecosystem. It is in the treetops hotel that Princess Elizabeth slept as a princess and woke up as a queen. And when that facility was shut down, it was very devastating to the people of Nyeri and the Abadia ecosystem. So when the people of Nyeri heard that the son of the deputy president is interested in leasing that facility from KWS and reopen it, there was joy and new relation in the Abadias. Since this hotel opened, 45 Kenyans are back to work. The mama and boga we talked about during our campaign are supplying vegetables to that hotel. The local butchers are supplying me to that hotel. 
the traditional Moboko dancers come every weekend to entertain the tourists and get some payment. The tourism circuit of the Abadea is back because of these two young men who are now being demonized as crooks, as criminals, who should not invest in their own motherland because they are the sons of the deputy president. The deputy president of the Republic of Kenya spends a lot of time in one of his functions that he has been given by the president to coordinate development partners and look for investors. Why should the deputy president go to look for foreign investors when his own children can invest at home? Children of many other people I know hide their money in Dubai and Cayman Islands. They don't want to invest here. What crime have the children of the Deputy President of the Republic of Kenya committed by borrowing money from a bank to buy a hotel and spa tourism, create employment, and spa business within the local environment? These boys are so demoralized. Asking me, Dad, why? Didn't you advise us that it's a crime to be your children? That we have no life of our own? That we shouldn't invest in our own country? And if we dare to invest, we should do it at our proxy so that we conceal our identity. Are we criminals by virtue of being your children? That's a question my children are asking me. What crime can children of Kenya commit to borrow money from a bank and start an enterprise and employ people and spa tourism? How unfair can a country be to its young population to condemn them for being enterprising? I'm being told by the National Assembly that I need to be impeached from office because my children have dared to borrow money, buy property in their name and invest in their own country. And for that, their father should be sent home. I won't conclude by Karate Farm Limited. This is a farm I founded in 2001 with my wife, Pastor Dockers. And it runs our farms. It runs our dairy farm in Nyeri that is doing very well. I'm making a million shillings also every month. And I sell calves. And it's doing very well. And my farm now has become a model farm for the local farmers. We are doing chicken, we are doing rabbits, we are doing sheep. Again, nobody has told me what crime has currently Farm committed. Technical Supplies and Services, Kenya Limited, a company I founded in 2001. I did business during the Kibaki era. When things got very bad, I stopped doing business with it. It has not done business for the last eight years. And of course, in the two years I've been deputy president. I want proof tomorrow, the National Assembly to table proof what these companies have done. They'll be very embarrassed before the people of Kenya. This will be the most shameful act ever in the history of our National Assembly. Where you go, table a motion that is so sensational, based on trash, and not a single accusation backed by evidence. I have seen an allegation that exerting influence on officials of the Ministry of Lands to issue an allotment letter to Amunyoro Investments Limited and using the fraudulently acquired documents to support a court case. Again, Amunyoro Investments Limited was never allotted any land. This parcel of land, 209 stroke 12077, 
wa Munyoro acquired at 24 million shillings in the year 2012. The documents are there, we'll give them to you. Purchase from a third party. Somebody went to the National Art Commission and lodged a case and claimed the property belonged to him. A senior, a former senior outside the Ministry of Lands. And the National Art Commission made that determination. The records are there. That the land belongs to a Monero Investments Limited. Again, he went to the High Court in the year 2022. I was not Deputy President. I made my witness statement before I became Deputy President. I supplied all documents before I became Deputy President. I did not file any evidence as Deputy President. And the matter was concluded. And the High Court issued a judgment. We'll give you the judgment that the land belongs to Aminoro Investments Limited. I am told that they have appealed the judgment. I invite the Honorable Mutuse to apply to be co-joined in the appeal and then he can argue his case. This is a matter that has been adjudicated by the High Court of Kenya and made a determination. And you want to bring it to the National Assembly. The matter is alive with the Court of Appeal. It is sub duties to even discuss it in Parliament because a determination has been made. Irregular procurement of mosquito nets at a cost of 3.7 billion. I saw a huge headline from the Star newspaper, planted headline. This is the most ridiculous headline I've ever seen. And this is the most I lack a proper one that I don't want to speak in Kikuyu. <laughs> I think somebody needs to give me some water. <laughs> what uh, I want, I'm looking for. Uh, <clears throat> I have seen that allegation. <laughs> I want to respond as follows. One. There is Andrew Murwa here, so on and David David with the false allegations. And he had better be very careful. Because he has made a statement on oath. In the affidavit, he says that uh, Deputy President was involved in KEMSA 3.7 billion irregular procurement of malaria nets, either directly or through proxies. Father, Shobika Impex Limited is an international company, the fourth largest manufacturer of mosquito nets in the world. It has done many tenders with KEMSA, with the Global Fund, countries in Africa and Asia. And there was a tender. There was a tender funded by Global Fund through KEMSA, and it was an international tender <coughs> for manufacturers. The company owned by my son Christo Kenya Limited are not manufacturers, and they did not participate in any way in the tender, in any way. What happened is that in the year 2014, eight years before I became deputy president, Shobika Impex Limited appointed Crystal Kenya as their local agent, whose work is to do the errands and follow their supplies at the ports of entry. Crystal Kenya did not participate in this tender. It was done by Shobika. Kemsa wrote to Shobika and said, your tender was not successful.
because you had a problem with pagination of your security document. Pagination. Those of you who have done tenders, you number the pages. And if they are not right, you can be disqualified. And therefore, they were told, can you come and collect your bid board? Your original bid board. That's what happens. If you participate in a tender and you don't win, you are asked to collect your bid board. And they kept on coming to collect the bid board. It was not available for almost three months. And they asked the local agent, that is Crystal Kenya Limited, can you follow up on our behalf? We participated in this tender. We did not win. We have a letter asking us to collect the bid board. We are waiting for it because this is money that is tied as our agent in Kenya. Can you follow up? And that is why when my son on behalf of Crystal Kenya Limited went to Kemsa trying to follow up. And when it was not working, he brought it to my attention and I made a call to Mr. Andrew Mulwa asking my son has been here. There is a little issue about a bid board of an unsuccessful trender. Why is it that this is money that is tied and these are foreigners, these are foreign investors. We don't want to make life difficult for them, please. Why don't you release it to it unless there's a problem? Oh, you say, no, 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 the matter is under investigation. That is why we cannot release it. The big bodies with the SEC. I said, ah, fine. If the matter is under investigation, so be it. Right along, the investigations were over. ESCC wrote to Kemsa and returned the bid board. Kemsa in return wrote to Shobika and returned the bid board. End of story. Shobika did not win the tender. They were not awarded the contract to supply the nets. No nets were supplied by Shobika. No public funds were lost, and we are told by Deputy President asking why a bid board to a tenderer who has failed to win cannot be returned, he endangered the lives of the people of Kenya. <laughs> that is how absurd the allegation is. There is no evidence that the company would my, my son participated the tender. They did not participate. There is no evidence that the deputy president interfered with the tender. The only crime is that urging so that we don't frustrate foreign investors. If they were not successful, why are you keeping their tender security? They, you need to give it to them. And it was a lot of money. I think it was 500 million or something like that. So I want to see this is a very ridiculous, and, and, and I take great exception to the headline by um, the star. Please, we'll give you the documents. Tell us where was the deputy president involved in that tender? This is a tender that never was, and for the record, to show that this tender had no problem after the investigations. During the investigations, the CEO, Terry Ramathani, was suspended to allow investigations as it should be. And Mulwa became the CEO. Mulwa was not there during the tendering. He came after the tender had been annulled. And now he was dealing with the aftermath of the annulment of the tender, that is returning the bid boards, sending document to ACC. After investigations by ACC and the Senate were concluded, Terry Ramadani was appointed by President William Ruto as the Deputy High Commissioner to India. That tells you, because when those appointments are made, the Head of Public Service writes to ACC, DCI, on issues of integrity. Terry was cleared, which means there was no scandal. And again, and most important, no public funds were lost, no nets were supplied. Therefore, this is another fishing expedition.
to just justify the 5.2 billion. I think that is why they were putting the 3.7 billion to to make the maths to to add up. You know, when you want to, to talk big figures, you must look for 3.7, 600, and all that. Even all these things I've read here, if you take your phones, we are nowhere even. We have not reached two billion because Olive Garden 400 million, Queen's Gate Apartment 600 million. Uh, all uh, outspan and uh, and uh, and uh, trade of 600. So these are just figures that were being put to the people of Kenya, so that they can see us uh, into 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 bad light. Unnecessary and expensive renovation at the official residence in Karen and Mombasa. How Mutusen knew is unnecessary? I don't know. He has never been here. You guys were here before. When President William Ruto was deputy president, he was denied funds for five years. This place was in very high state of disrepair. It took me seven months to move in. The roofs were reeking, the toilets were blocked, the septic tanks was, was, was broken down, the borehole was broken, there was nothing. Parliament, in his own wisdom, allocated funds for the renovation of this residence. As a deputy president, I have nothing to do with public expenditure. In fact, at that time, the accounting officer, between 2022 and 2023 financial year, was a state house controller. Procurement was done, tender was awarded, and the renovations were done. As and you can see, the place looks good. There was need to dignify the office of the deputy president because he has a function of coordinating development partners, ambassadors and high commissioners, and all sorts of international visitors are always here. So to dignify the office of the deputy president, the residents needed to be in the right standard, and that is not my decision, and I have nothing to do with it. As for the contractor who was awarded the job, I don't know him, and I don't need to know him. I have no business. Where he transferred his money, I would not know. I have no access to his account. Whether he is related to me, the answer is no. I don't know him. And for the record, I don't wish to know him, because it's not necessary. Government expenditure is audited every year by the Auditor General. Since this office was under the executive of the Deputy President for that financial year, the Auditor General did her inspection and gave us a clean bill of health. The innovations that were done were not highlighted with having any audit query. If the Honorable Mutuse had taken his time to look at the Auditor General's report, he would not have brought this baseless accusation. And even if there was an accusation, it should be directed to the accounting officer who is a state house controller, not me. I don't deal with procurement. I don't deal with, with financial management. I don't deal with anything to do with public finances. But since the matter has been raised, I have to answer to it. I have looked at the Auditor General's report, clean. I have looked at the contract, it's signed by the Controller of State House. As to the work that I can attest, they did a very good job. And this residence has been dignified. The same with the residence in Mombasa. You know the residence in Mombasa is where President William Ruto and his wife, Mama Rachel, were chased away and the house allocated to the regional commissioner. And on a swimming office, I took up the residence. It was in state of disrepair. Again, it was renovated. It's a good place. And I normally go there when I go to Mombasa. And it makes a lot of sense. Because before the renovation of that residence, any time I went to Mombasa, I normally have a huge delegation of security people, hospitality, and all that that goes with the office, not leading me. The bills were very expensive.
it makes a lot of sense to have an official residence for the deputy president in Mombasa so that when he is there, you cut down on public expenditure. Um, <clears throat> dubiously acquiring a substantial portion of some of 100 million paid to Lusona events limited. Again, that's another ridiculous acquisition from the north. Uh, this is people who give services here for events. We have many meetings. You have come here for IBEC. There are tents put up here to the required standard. We have meetings here for development partners. This is a very busy residence. Most of you have been here. Again, I don't get involved in procurement. That is the work of the accounting officer and his team in public finance management. As to the person who does that work, I don't know he or, uh, he or she, and I have no business knowing who does the work. Those are things that are not in my purview. Again, the ridiculous accusations that that money came to me, one would have to demonstrate how it came to me. Was it brought to me through my account, through cash, who was there, what is the evidence? Again, it is just trying to throw mud at me. And I want to say that uh, that accusation has, is baseless, and we believe we want to see the mover of the motion coming up with tangible evidence. Again, these accusations lack particularities and specifics. They are just generalized accusations. Again, we'll be challenging that again in court because there is a ruling that grounds of impeachment must be well grounded and must be particularized and specific. This is just an allegation. Where is the nexus between the supplier of events to this residence and the deputy president? There is no nexus. I don't know the person. I don't know the company. I'm not involved in the procurement. I don't even know how it is procured. All I do is I want events and they are arranged and I take part in those events. Uh, those accusations of funds utilizing the deputy president, in the office of the deputy president, coming for my personal benefit are ridiculous, unfounded, and totally malicious, and there is no evidence whatsoever. And I want you people of the press to also have these people to give you the evidence. Don't just write headlines. Ask, where is the evidence? Where are the particulars? You know, you don't just allege, oh, this particular supplier, this money went to the deputy president. Yes, fine, that is good. How? How did it go to the deputy president? You must explain. Uh, alleged sensational but false allegations against Lady Justice S. Minor. It is alleged that the special needs of motion at ground four had a gross violation of the constitution that I publicly attacked the lady Justice Esther Minor and falsely threatened to bring action against her. I did not threaten to bring any action against Justice Minor. I did bring action against her. I was just informing the public because I'm a public officer and I have freedom of speech. I have filed petition before the Judicial Service Commission against Justice Esther Minor in issues I felt I did not get proper justice. So I did not threaten her. I did what the law says. If you are, dis if you are not happy with the conduct of a judge, you file a petition before the justice, the, judge, uh, the, the, the Judicial Service Commission, which I have done. Again, I don't want to delve before the matters because it is again subjudice. But that I have done, so I cannot be threatened. Uh, I cannot be said to threaten her. And again, I have a right as a leader, as a Kenyan, to say what I'm doing. And I did say publicly that I will bring a petition against her, and I have done it. And the evidence is there. You see it. We have filed a petition, and we are waiting for it to be concluded. A 
as, again, I want to emphasize that uh, my statements or protected speech consequent to a decision by the land judge in a matter involving my personal assets, which I disagree with and found to be wholly unfair. The matter having been concluded at last stage, my criticism of the decision was not subjudice, nor in any other manner prohibited by law. While I respond to the ruling of the judge, I was in absolute disagreement with it. Contrary to the assertions, the special motion, I did not falsely threaten to bring action against the land judge. I took legal action available to every citizen of Kenya uh, under Article 168. Two of the Constitution, which allows any person to petition the Judicial Service Commission for the removal of any judge and filed a legal complaint before the Judicial Service Commission in March 2024. The complaint being live before the JSC, discussion of the conduct of the land judge in the said matter here would be subjudice. Diverting materials meant for construction of Kilifi Malidi Highway to Tamaka Private Road to Fibigo Beach Resort. Again, I say. Vipingo Beach Resort belongs to the estate of the late Governor Gashagua. The facts are as follows. King Charles III visited Kenya between 30th October 2023 and 3rd November 2024. During his state visit, one of the designated places where King Charles III was to visit was Kuritu Marine Conservancy, which shares a road with the Vipingo Beach Resort. And it's a public road, by the way, it's not a private road. I have an extra copy of the program of the state visit to Kenya by King Charles III, marked RG, which at page 13 on items 63 and 64 shows his departure and arrival at Kurit Marine Conservancy. As I was walking around, I slept there, uh, I think, two, three weeks before the arrival of the king. And as you all know, I walk every morning. And as I walked on that road, I found there was a lot of activity and tarmac was going on. I was very happy and I asked what was happening. And I was told that the king himself, the third, will be coming. So, like all other residents of that area, uh, we are very indebted to King Charles III that this was done very speedily. Regarding Gashagua never called anybody <laughs> to do this road. In fact, I'm informed that this road is donor funded, the one to Kilifi. And there is a component of corporate social responsibility. And I have learned after I have inquired that um, these people of um, uh, there is a, there is a that road is called Takawungu Shariani Vipingo. It's off the main road. And uh, I am made to understand that uh, Kuruinu, Kuritu Marine Conservancy, Vipingo Secondary School, Shariani Primary School, among other stakeholders, including a, park, a, mark, a public market, applied to Kenha to be considered for. corporate social responsibility. And I think the issue of the king hastened that request. And that's why I said we are grateful to the king. Again, I invite evidence to show that I influenced that road. In any case, I would like to know the member of parliament for that area how he will vote in this motion. He should be a very happy man. If Deputy President Ricardo Gashagua occasioned a tarmac road to be done in his constituency, he should vote for me. But I didn't. And when I went there, that Shariani market, people are very happy with that road. Because I walk there in the morning when I sleep there. People are very happy with that road. The secondary school there, the boys and girls are very happy. The primary schools are there. And again, contrary to the assertion by the Honorable Mutuse, it's not a private road. It's a public road. And it is serving many people. A primary school, a secondary school, a market and a whole community, including the family of the estate of the late governor, the late Washawa. We are just beneficiaries of good deeds by our government that were hastened by the arrival of King, of His Majesty the King, the Third. 
undermining the president and the cabinet by allegedly making contradictory public statements from the position taken by cabinet regarding the evacuation of the people residing along Nairobi River. To start with, for the record, President William Ruto has never complained to me that I have undermined him. If he has told that to Honorable Mutuse, I would like to know that he has complained to Honorable Mutuse that his deputy has undermined him. Article 147 of the Constitution provides the deputy president shall be the principal assistant to the president and shall deputize for the president in the execution of the president's functions. Article 28, which states that every person has inherent dignity and the right to have that dignity respected and protected. Article 29C, which states that every person has the right to freedom and security of the person, which includes the right not to be subjected to any form of violence from either public or private sources. Section 152G1 of the Land Act, which states that notwithstanding any provisions to the contrary in this act or in any other written law, all eviction shall be carried out in strict accordance with the following procedures. A. Be preceded by proper identification of those taking part in the eviction or demolitions. B. Be preceded by the presentation or the formal authorizations for the action. C. Where groups of people are involved, government officials or their representatives to be present during an eviction. D to be carried out in a manner which respects the dignity, right to life, and security of those affected. Included special measures to ensure effective protection to groups and people who are vulnerable, such as women, children, and elderly, and persons with disabilities. F, include special measures to ensure that there is no arbitrary deprivation of property or possessions as a result of the eviction. G, include mechanisms to protect property and possessions left behind involuntarily from destruction. H, respect the principles of necessity and proportionality during the use of force and give the affected person the first priority to demolish and salvage their property. Critically, our constitution provides at section uh, 147.2 that first, the deputy president shall perform the functions conferred by these constitutions and any other functions of the president as the president may assign. Pass one to Article 3 of the Constitution. I, as well as every citizen of Kenya and state of public officers, have the obligation to respect, uphold, and defend the Constitution in performing any of my functions. The national values and principles of governance contained in Article 10 of the Constitution by those state organs, public officers, and all persons, including myself as the deputy president, wherever we make or implement public policy decisions. <clears throat> in relation to this matter, these national values and principles include the rule of law, democracy, and participation of the people, human dignity, equity, social justice, inclusiveness, equality, human rights, non-discrimination, and protection of the marginalized. Adherence to these principles became extremely important when we, as state officers, are contemplating legal evacuation of citizens with a duty to avoid inhuman forced evictions that would be contrary to our constitution and international law. While campaigning with the president, and subsequently when I was sworn in as deputy president, you can remember, I promised as a key pillar to the Kenya Kwanzaa government that there will be no forced and unlawful evictions and that all evictions shall be human and entail legal compensation. You remember my inauguration speech. I said never again shall this administration carry out inhuman evictions in a brutal manner as was done in the previous administration. I and my office, the Deputy President, have undertaken extensive engagement with all parties in regard to the Cabinet decision on eviction, which I fully support, including the Nairobi River, which is an entity under the ODP and County Government of Nairobi. 
adherence to these principles become extremely important when we as state officers are contemplating legal evacuation of citizens with a duty to avoid inhuman force defections that would be contrary to our constitution and international law. Guideline number six of the United Nations General Assembly, guidelines for the implementation of the rights to adequate housing prohibits forced evictions and the state should ensure that any eviction under domestic law are fully compliant with international law. The guidelines further require meaningful engagement with communities to ensure that the rights of residents are implemented cooperatively without the need for eviction procedures or police enforcement. I have supported enforcement, implementation of cabinet directives on the eviction, safe for the fact that on being informed that each person deciding a drunk Nairobi River was being evicted and paid only 10,000 shillings, which I and many other Kenyans felt inadequate compensation for eviction. I insisted that the government should abide by constitutional dictates and international norms while implementing any cabinet decision including eviction and maintain the dignity of citizens of Kenya facing evictions. My statements did not and cannot be construed to undermining the president because the president, like me, sought to defend the very constitution. I hope I'm very clear. Am I clear? I cannot. I will not oversee, supervise, forced, brutal eviction against the people of Kenya. That I will not. And I can't. President William Ruto and I on the campaign trail gave a solemn undertaking to the people of Kenya that under our administration that will never happen. So when I was asked to oversee brutal inhuman eviction against innocent people without notice, without compensation, without due regard to what the constitution says, I found it very, very difficult and I rescued myself and allowed the CS for Interior, the Head of Public Service, the PS for Internal Security to proceed. If that is the reason why Regadi Gashagwa should be impeached as Deputy President of the Republic of Kenya and sent home for refusing to undermine the Constitution, for saying no to brutal and inhuman eviction of poor Kenyans, let it be. Undermining devolution by allegedly holding a meeting in Nairobi. <laughs> Good people. I'm sure you are as embarrassed as I am. That a deputy president holding a public meeting to talk to the people of Kenya is undermining devolution. To start with, Deputy President Regadi Gashagua, in the duties spelled out by the President under Executive Order Number One of 2023, he has the duties to coordinate intergovernmental relations. I work with the governors. This is the home of devolution. I hold meetings with the governors every day. I chair IBEC. I cannot be accused. And I need evidence tabled that I had divine devolution. The motion alleges that on 29 September 2024, I unlawfully interfered with the running of the Nairobi City Council government by holding a public rally where I allegedly incited citizens against law directives of the county government on planning and relocation of markets. This is my response. It is not true that I incited citizens against the law directives of the county government, as alleged. I wish to clarify and point out that when I held the public rally, I merely requested the governor of Nairobi County to speak and listen to grievances which were being raised by the market traders. Videos will be produced tomorrow in the National Assembly. I regard Kashagwa asking Governor Sakaja to take time to listen to the people 
and listen to their grievances. The traders had sought me out to intervene and request the governor on their behalf to dialogue with them and seek a solution to their grievances with regard to the relocation of markets. Had the governor listened to these traders, they would have had no business coming looking for me. All I was saying is listen to the people. Before you relocate them, have public participation. Most of those traders have lived in Wakulima market for 40 years. They wanted to discuss with the governor what happens to us, what happens to our customers, what happens to the distances that we cover, what about the extra cost of going to the new relocation. And I think the traders were right. Requesting a meeting with an elected leader is their right. And when they requested me to go and meet them, because they were desperate and they needed somebody to hear to them, I did go and speak to them. Again, this motion alleges that on 20 September 2024, I unlawfully interfered with the running of the Nobel City Council by inciting citizens against law directives of the county government. The leadership of Nairobi business traders approached me sometime in March 2024 at my official residence to discuss multiple issues affecting business and requested engagement in the resolution and intervention on these issues adverse to business. Consequent to this meeting, I directed that short, medium and long-term strategies be undertaken, coordinated by the Office of the Deputy President to address the issues raised that are cross-cutting with the agencies including KRA, Kenya Post Authority, Counterfeit Authority, Kenya Bureau of Standards, the National Police Service, Kenya Corporate Board, given that the violation is under the office of the Deputy President. I was just doing my work. On 11th April 2024, the Small Traders and Government Agencies Technical Committee, committed by, coordinated by my office, held a meeting to discuss issues raised by the small traders, including Muduro Market, attended by ODP staff, in a supportive role in keeping with the draft framework of cooperation and engagement between the government, Nairobi City County, and the Nairobi business traders. Subsequent to that meeting, a meeting on 24th April 2024 between Nairobi City Council and the Nairobi small traders and numerous others, the ODP on 22nd July 2024 invited his, his Johnson Sakaja, among his other state officers, to a meeting at ODP officers in, uh, scheduled for 22nd July 2024 to review the draft framework of the cooperation and engagement between the small traders and the government of Kenya. On 3rd September 2024, the ODP wrote to Governor Johnson Sakaja and all other stakeholders submitting a final combined draft of the framework for review and feedback. In except, uh, after all the engagement between all the parties and the draft framework, Governor Sakaja decided to arbitrarily proceed with the relocation of Muthura Market. That gave rise to the cry by the people. Meetings had been held, a framework had been agreed on. And as an elected leader, as deputy president, I think going to listen to people who are in anguish, who are crying, is responsible leadership. The government that President William Ruto and I lead is a listening government. And going to listen to people cannot be an impeachable crime. I would like to know how members of parliament would want to send me home for going to listen to people who are crying that they need to be listened to. I would like to understand. Undermining devolution by allegedly holding meetings to fight alcohol. I think tomorrow will be the greatest circus. Or do I call it the theater of the absurd? That Deputy President Regard Gashagwa, undertaking duties assigned to him by the President to fight illicit brews and drugs across the country, should be impeached because by doing so, he is interfering with the devolution. I held meetings in Nyeri, attended by Governor Kahiga, Governor Waiguru, Governor Irogo Kangata, Governor Wamatangi, Governor Kiari Badilisha. I 
I held a meeting in Chuka attended by governors of Embu, of Tharakanithi, of Meru. I attended a meeting in Mombasa attended by governors of Kwale, a representative of the governor of Mombasa, the governor of Taita Taveta, a representative of the governor of Lamu to discuss. I held a meeting in Akuru near with all governors present and all of us jointly under my chairmanship, the Ministry of Interior and Governors, we agreed on how to tackle the menace of illicit brews. And we have a good story to tell. Out of those efforts, our young men who are sleeping in trenches are back home. Women are very happy. Their husbands are back home and they are bringing food. In fact, some children have been born. Some have even been named Rigiji because of the effort that I have put in fighting illicit bruise. I think the people of Kenya would be shocked to hear tonight that one of the accusations against their deputy president and why he should go home is because he led the battle to fight illicit bruise and drugs that has caused havoc among our young people. Please, if Rigadi Gashagwa is a problem, why don't you assign this job to somebody else? Because this job must be done. We must get our children off drugs. We must fight illicit alcohol. And seeing that you want to impeach the deputy president because fighting illicit bruise and drugs is interfering with the devolution. I, I, I think this is, is the greatest joke of the year. Even the 291 MPs who signed this motion, most of them, because I know them, have looked for me personally to thank me for the way I have successfully led the war against drugs and illicit bruise. And that is why that sham public participation should have had my responses so that the women could hear that one of the accusations against their deputy president is that he should be sent home because he was leading the war against illicit bruise and drugs. I don't know. I, I, I think there is something wrong in this country. That somebody has sat down to draft a motion to impeach the Deputy President of the Republic of Kenya. And one of the grounds is that he has interfered with the devolution by leading the war to fight illicit bruise and drugs. This is a hate of absurdity. And parliament will be the theater of the absurd. I would like to hear what, what is the nexus between fighting illicit brew and fight interfering with the devolution. I would like to know. I've never had any governor complain. I've never had any MCA complain. I've never had any Kenyan complain. The only Kenyans who have complained are few. They are the manufacturers who are manufacturing poison and are the guys of producing alcohol. Those are the only few ones. I beg the National Assembly and the Senate, most of the National Assembly, to save face to consider striking this ground before the motion tomorrow because it sounds ridiculous to the people of Kenya. Again, if Deputy President Gad Gashagwa has to be sent home for fighting drugs and illicit alcohol, so be it. Sensational statements against the National Intelligence Service and its Director General and other officers. My response, 
In relation to this allegation, I wish to state that the National Intelligence Service holds a very critical role in ensuring the safety and security of our country. They are responsible for gathering intelligence and share it with all our law enforcement agencies to ensure that the country is safe at all times. Consequently, when the country was caught flat-footed with regard to the scope and extent of the public's dissatisfaction with the Finance Bill 2024, which degenerated in the GNC protests, it pointed to the failure of the National Intelligence Service in carrying out its mandate. I am persuaded that the National Intelligence Service ought to have known beforehand that the public was completely opposed to the finance bill and they ought to have briefed the president before the protest began as this would have caused a change of tact by government regarding the proposed bill and protest which culminated in the loss of innocent lives and destruction of property could have been avoided. Hence, I express my opinion as this is my public in my public media briefing in Mombasa and my utterances were not any different from what happens to other countries when there is lapse or failure by the intelligence agencies. Many of you will recall that after September 11th terrorist attack in the US, the US intelligence agencies were massively criticized and inquiry was even open to investigate why the intelligence agency was not able to detect and thwart the terror attack. Under the constitution of Kenya, the government agencies are supposed to be accountable to the Kenyan people, including the National Intelligence Service, and calling them out when they are is that the dedication of duty does not amount to undermining them. In any case, the Director General of NIS is not above the law. He is a public officer. Just like the President, the Deputy President, Cabinet Ministers, he too is subject to criticism, like any other public officer. In fact, I'll have videos. President William Ruto as deputy president at one time criticized the then director general of the National Intelligence Service. In another video, he heavily criticized the then inspector general of police for other performance. I have learned from my boss how this job is done. <laughs> it's clear. It's done. I mean, nobody, the president is criticized daily. The deputy president is criticized daily, and we take no offense. The director general of the National Intelligence Service is not above the law. He is a public officer. He is accountable to the people of Kenya. And when one feels he has underperformed, he'll be called out. Because that is the nature of the Kenyan state. And this I learned from my boss when he was deputy president. Again, there was an issue that the president and I committed ourselves publicly but never again in our administration shall, we sh shall ever we allow abductions and extrajudicial killings despite the police keeping on misleading the president to say that there are no abductions you all know you have evidence on video that they have happened and that is what I commented and I said it is wrong and because I'm a, I'm a truthful person, I'll see what is wrong when it happens. Despite the fact that I am compelled by the principle of collective responsibility to be part and parcel of every decision made by government, that I'll continue to do so. But only those decisions that are constitutional and within the rule of law. Abductions and judicial killings are unconstitutional. I will never support them. President William Ruto has been criticized left, right, and center. I have not seen him take anybody to court for criticizing him. Why is Regadi Gashagua being impeached for calling out the Director General of the National Intelligence Service. The Deputy President is criticized daily. The judiciary is criticized daily. The media is criticized daily, including the star whom I've criticized today. <laughs> but that is as far as it goes. And again, despite being just the Deputy President, I enjoy a constitutional right in the Bill of Rights freedom of speech. 
And if the Director General of the National Intelligence Service was aggrieved, there are mechanisms of how he can take me to court and sue me for defamation. And I will be able to argue why I said what I said. So that is not a ground for impeachment. I mean, that is curtailing liberties, the freedom of expression, the freedom to hold public officers accountable for their actions. And I want to say finally, I think I've literally addressed all the grounds because I felt it's important for the people of Kenya to know the allegations against the Deputy President and his responses. And as you have heard, though you are not judges and you are not advocates, there is nothing here that violates the Constitution. <coughs> there is no gross. misconduct. There is no crime that has been committed. I'm innocent on all these charges and I want to clarify my apology yesterday to the president did not in any way imply that I'm guilty of these charges. I'm not. This I'm not. My statement was that if there is something I've done to the president that I don't know that probably has upset him, I ask for his forgiveness. But that was in no way an admission of this ridiculous allegations meant to overturn the will of the people. Finally, in conclusion, I want to say that overturning the will of the people is not a joke. It calls for very serious violation of the Constitution. None of these issues here meet the threshold. We'll go to Bunga tomorrow. I'll be there at five for two hours, and I'll put my case. In the unfortunate event it proceeds to the Senate, I'll be there again to prove my innocence by way of evidence. When I called this press conference, there was a lot of speculation that Rigad Gashagwa wants to resign. <laughs> this is a man elected by 7.2 million Kenyans. How dare you suggest to him that he can do so without public participation? I have no intention whatsoever to resign from this job. I'll fight to the end. I have tremendous respect for our judiciary and the professional judges of the High Court, the Court of Appeal and the Supreme Court. And in the professional manner they have handled serious issues affecting Kenya. The impeachment of a deputy president elected by 7.2 million Kenyans is not a small matter that can hastily be decided by a few members of parliament and senators and wish it away. I'll submit myself to independent institutions to get justice. And I'm sure, I have no doubt in my mind 
that I'll get justice. And this impeachment will be thrown out. And I'll carry out my duties as Deputy President. That is why anybody sending feelers to me to resign is a joker. And I found a few people using my friends to come and sweet talk to me. Please, my friends, I don't want to become enemies with you. When you are given such silly messages, don't bring them to me. I have no intention. I cannot resign. I did not give myself this job. I was given by the people of Kenya. I have done nothing wrong against the people of Kenya whatsoever. I have worked hard. I have been very loyal to my boss, President William Ruto. I have worked hard every day. And now not be distracted. I think there's one issue I have forgotten, one ground. The issue of the shareholding, isn't it? Even you guys can remind me if there's one issue that I have not uh, dealt with. Somebody there give me my notes on shareholding. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I have them here. That's okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. This is an important one. Ah, yeah, yeah. There are several. I have not. Uh, uh, there are a few silly ones. Uh, there is one that. Uh, <laughs> is one that uh, I'm conniving with cartels in the tea sector to block ATDA from implementing guaranteed minimum returns that would benefit small traders. The allegation is not true. No evidence whatsoever has been adduced to, subs to substantiate this claim. As far as I know, I've successfully completed my mandate, which was assigned to me by the president, which culminated into creating synergy between people who had taken KTDA to court and suspended the operation of the T Act. As a result, the T Act now is in operation. The president never mandated me to take over the affairs of the Minister of Agriculture. He asked me to spearhead T reforms. I did the T conference in Kericho, brought all the stakeholders together, and as a result, I created a synergy among all the stakeholders. And we agreed that those people who had gone to court withdraw the cases. And now the T Act is operational, and that will see meaningful reforms. As to claims that I have stopped the selling of tea in Mombasa, there is no evidence to that effect. And I want to call upon the Honorable Mutuse to, to, to provide that evidence. Again, in matters coffee, I was given a job by the president to initiate coffee reforms, which I have done successfully. I held a coffee conference in Meru for three days in 2023. For the last two years, I have been working with stakeholders, including members of parliament and the Senate, which has culminated into two bills, the coffee bill 2023 and the cooperative bill 2023. These two bills, the coffee bill 2023, will see the reintroduction of the Coffee Board of Kenya that will market coffee for farmers without putting profit. We have also recommended the reintroduction of the Coffee Research Foundation or the Coffee Research Institute in Roiro to work on better varieties and drought resistant crops. Through my efforts, again, I have completed my work. The two bills are before the National Assembly. I call upon members of the National Assembly immediately after the impeachment process to embark on these two bills and see them to fruition so that farmers can enjoy the work we have done in coffee reforms. I have seen another absurd 
that have taken control of our local cooperative society in Madira constituency. We have as a member of parliament. This is false. I should be told which society by name because I know all the societies. I know all the farmers by name. It's really ridiculous. Again, there is no evidence. There is nothing. It's just trying to spoil my name before the people of Madeira who elected me as their member of parliament. On the issues of shareholding, I think this matter has been discussed for a long time. And I think it's good tonight I put it in proper perspective. I wish to state that the allegation is equally false. None of my family members, allies, or seats are in control of any cooperative society in Madeira. That one I had done. Um, in shareholding by virtue of the provisions of the third schedule of the Political Parties Act, the constituent parties of Kenya Kwanzaa Coalition entered into various agreements which were deposited with the Speaker of the National Assembly and the Speaker of the Senate for purposes of Article 108 of the Constitution of Kenya. 16.2, the following were members, parties of Kenya Kwanzaa, UDA, ANC, Ford Kenya, PAR, Farmers Party, Chama Chakazi, Communist Party, Economic Freedom Party, the Service Party, Tujibebe Wa Kenya Party, Umoja na Maendeleo Party of Kenya, and the Democratic Party of Kenya. In accordance with provisions of Clause 3E of Schedule 5 of the Political Parties Act, each of the agreements contained in a power sharing development agenda for certain regions in Kenya. I attach here copies of the said agreement. I'll give you the Kenya Kwanzaa agreement so that you know when I talk about shareholding, I'm not talking about Kenyans, I'm talking about this agreement that was signed by President William Ruto and almost everybody else on how power will be shared. I've never talked about sharing resources. I have been talking about power sharing for people to get what they deserve in sharing power in accordance with this agreement. Like, for example, in an agreement between UDA and C and Ford Kenya, the UDA would nominate the president and the deputy presidential candidates, which has happened. I got my share, although I have no share certificate. The president would guarantee the stature, dignity, financial and operational autonomy of those of the deputy president. It's in the agreement. The office of the deputy president will be allowed specific duties identified at Article 21 of the agreement. ANC will be allocated a position of cabinet, prime cabinet secretary to be established within 14 days. It was given to Musalia. The office of the deputy president, uh, Ford Kenya will be allocated the position of the speaker of the National Assembly, which was given to Moses Wetangula. In, uh, in accord with Article 2.1 of the power sharing agreement, ANC and Ford Kenya would have a 30% share of national government positions. So, the Honorable Musalia Mdavadi, the Honorable Etangula, and the people of Western, please don't call them Rikati Kashagwa. The agreement is here defining your share in the government. It is not me. I did not sign this document. It was signed by Musalia. Wetangula and President William Ruto. So when I say about this share thing in terms of positions, I've never talked about resources, about development, although it is also here, is that regions bargained with the president for shares. Musalia Mudavadi and Moses Wetangula bargained for 30% of shares within the Kenya Kwanzaa government. Although there were also some to give a 70% of the vote, which they did not. <laughs> Nevertheless, since they gave a certain vote, they are still entitled to some share, one way or, or another. So it is not regarding Ashagwa who said that a government is like a company. It is the agreement of the Kenya Kwanzaa, which I'll be troubling in the National Assembly. It is not me. It went ahead to say it. He said, ANC and Ford Kenya would have 30% share of national government positions. 
That is cabinet secretaries, principal secretaries, high commissioners, ambassadors, diplomatic and consular representatives, chairpersons of state corporations, directors of state corporations, chairpersons and, of, and commissions, constitutional commissions provided a 30% share is to be shared equally between the ANC and Ford Kenya. Sasa mimi nikiambia watu wafuate share yao makosa yako ni gani? Iko hapa. I did not sign. They went ahead. They went ahead. Musalia Mudavadi and Wetangula. And they must follow these things. Because I will not follow for them because I was not party to the Western agreement. The agreements were with regions. So when people say I'm dividing regions, I'm simply following the Kenya Kwanzaa agreement of the way it was debated. They went ahead and said, Article 22 of sharing agreement set out a list of priority projects which Kenya Kwanzaa would endeavor to fulfill in the ANC and Ford Kenya strongholds of Western Kenya between 2022 to 2027 on a priority basis. Musalia Mudavadi and Wetangula signed a package for Western Kenya. I have never had anybody call them tribalists, but they signed an agreement demanding for Western Kenya. They demanded, and it was agreed it will be done. Completion of all incomplete or stored butamen roads. Construction of an extra 1,000 kilometers of butamen in Western Kenya. Revival and modernization of sugar factories in Western Kenya. Establishment of new industries identified in Article 22 of the agreement. Ladies and gentlemen, this is the Kenya Kwanza agreement on shareholding. What crime has Regadi Gashawa committed to be impeached by saying what President William Ruto appended his signature to? With Musalia Mudavadi and Wetangula who will preside over my impeachment. What crime has this man committed? The crime of this man is just being truthful because people do not want these things to be known. That is a problem. People have a problem that I'm a truthful man. The people of Western Kenya has now known today what their leader signed with President William Ruto. It is upon them to demand their share as per this agreement. I did not sign this agreement. I will read the people who signed. But because I was present and I'm a truthful man, I fight for the people of Western Kenya. Power sharing agreement between Kenya Kwanzaa and Pa of Amazon Kingi. I want to give two examples. Yeah? In accord with Article 8 of the agreement, Pa would be allocated the position of the Speaker of the Senate. He negotiated for himself. <laughs> Let's be truthful. You brought this motion. We'll discuss. The people of Kenya must know the truth so that if Rigadi Gashagwa is being crucified for being truthful, let the people of Kenya know why he is being crucified. How can Moses Wetangula say I should be impeached because of saying people to get their shares when he is a signatory to a share agreement with the president? on what will go to Western Kenya. And then they accuse me of tribalism. They did not say anything should go to Central or Mount Kenya. They talked about Western. When I say something for Mountain, I'm a tribalist. King, he said, position of speaker, you are my power. Part 9A of the power sharing agreement, power would nominate the candidate for appointment of one principal secretary when Kenya Kwanza came to power. On the power. For Article 9B, the power sharing agreement, Kenya, Kwanzaa, and PA would agree on what share of national government positions, cabinet secretaries, principal secretaries, high commissioners, ambassadors, diplomatic and consular representatives, chairpersons, state corporations, etc., etc. Power sharing agreement, that is a word, so that nobody should ever again in this country ever accuse me of talking of shares. It is not me. 
It is my boss, President William Ruto, who appended the signature with other leaders that Kenya is like a company of shares. It is not me. And he did. He signed the agreements. Share in Kenya. You see, it's being shared. <laughs> Two of us. Two of us. They have shared the speaker. They have shared the Senate. They have shared the deputy president. They have shared the president. That's what I've been saying. And then I'm being told that I'm dividing the country along ethnic lines. I did not appear this signature. I'm just being truthful. That is my crime. People want these things to be hidden so that they pretend to be nationalistic and say regarding Gashagwa is tribal. But the people who are paid these signatures are the ones who should explain why they were signing things for their regions only. Yet they say they are national leaders. Power sharing agreement between the Kenya Kwanza Coalition on one part uh, and the Communist Party in nini, nini, nini. So, <laughs> service party, at least I saw Chama Chakazi. They say the party leader should get something. Moses Kulia was given something. <laughs> the service party of Mwangi Kujuri got nothing. You know? So, unajua sasa, ile shida iko Kenya hii ni ukora. And people not being truthful. The agreements are here. Like in a communist party, they have been making noise. They signed an agreement. They have not seen anybody. <laughs> yeah? So, Uh, my speeches on the shareholder issue are informed by their, form, their foresaid power sharing covenants, which are founded on law and lessons learned from the well known disputed 202 NAC power sharing agreement. Further power sharing agreements are a feature of government formation in all democracies in the world that provide the formation of coalitions. My pronouncements on the issue, properly understood, are not only anchored in law but entirely harmless and incapable of being construed as a basis for ethnic animosity, a danger to national cohesion or a threat to national unity. On the contrary, coalition building has been one of the most important innovations since the disputed 207 elections in ensuring stability, equitable sharing of political power, national cohesion, and fostering of national unity of national unity. Indeed, Kenya Kwanzaa's main opponent in the 2022 general election, Asimio Laumoja, one Kenya coalition party, was a political party consisting of 25 or so political parties who also executed a power sharing agreement as required by Schedule 3 of political parties. However, on the studying of the same power sharing agreements, upon election as the deputy president of Kenya, I went out of my way as required by the constitution of Kenya to serve all Kenyans regardless of their political preferences during the election or ethnic origin. I'll produce videos or know those things. Again, my decision to embrace the broad-based government following the decision of the cabinet after the GNC protest is that I support coalition building. And even when the Honorable Wright Odinga came, he got some shares. <laughs> True or false? I mean, surely, why is Regani Gashagwa being verified by just being truthful? You know, it's good to be truthful. I have heard that my saying we observe this agreement is a threat to national unity. I have never been caught by the National Cohesion and Integration Committee tell me that I have said something that can create ethnic disharmony. On the issues of one man, one vote, one shilling, I am told again that it can create tribal hatred. How? The one man, one vote, one shilling is not a formula for Mount Kenya region. Far from it. The one man, one vote, one shilling talks about equity. The gist of that formula is that all Kenyans should be treated equally. If we are giving bursary to the children of Kenya, let us agree how many children we have. If there are 30 million and we have 100 million, we divide equally and distribute to every constituency to those children. 
if a hospital takes care of a thousand patients, we decide based on population what is the size of the hospital to be constructed in Roiro where there are 800,000 people. If one borehole serves 500 people, do you construct one borehole in an area where there are 10,000 people? You need to construct more boreholes. That's all. And these populations are everywhere in Western Kenya, in Kisi, in Rift Valley. The high numbers are not just in the Mount Kenya region. This is a formula, in my view, that is good for everybody. Again, it is not a law because I pronounce myself. It's just an opinion. And in our democracy, I think it's only fair to allow people to have freedom of speech and to have to be entitled to an opinion. There are those who talk one man, one foot, one kilometer, and it is their right. And we should also listen to them and consider. And all those opinions can be harnessed and people can agree which is the best formula to take care of the people of Kenya. That is all I said. I wanted to, to, to read to the people, of course, the projects that were negotiated, but I, I, I don't seem to have that page. I produce it tomorrow in Parliament. So that when they hear I am fighting, I am also fighting for them. Mine, for the Mount Kenya, and President William moving from, we never wrote anything. Because I'm a very trusting man. So is my people. As we did word of mouth. So once in a while, we may argue kido kido because there is nothing written. So sometimes it's when people say I'm, I'm blackmailing the president. But I'm simply asking, you know, my boss, we agreed the following. Can we please do it? We agreed this on that. Can we do it? You know, we agreed that the people of Mount Kenya who had been given jobs by Uhuru will not be removed without being replaced. We don't seem to be honoring that. Can we honor it? We agreed where we needed to replace somebody who has not performed. We exchange one for one. Can we do it? We agreed that uh, we need to give Mau Roads priority. Can we please do it? Because that is what we agreed. It's simply people being honest with each other and living true to a gentleman's agreement. That is what it is all about. So I wanted to explain to the people of Kenya, I am not against any region of Kenya. I am just a crusader for honesty and for fulfilling written and unwritten agreements. That is all I am. I say if we agree on something, please let's do it. If we agreed we shall do ABCD before we are elected, let's do it. If we agreed we shall not brutally evict innocent people, please let's not do it. If we agreed that we shall create a good business environment for people to do business, please let's not do it. If we agreed there shall not be no abductions and extrajudicial killings, please let's be true to the people of Kenya. That is all. So I want to thank every one of you. And because I've been in Parliament, I don't think it's necessary to have questions. I've been very, very clear on all issues, why I called this a press briefing. I've said I'll be in Parliament tomorrow. I've asked my team to try to give you all the materials so that you can also go and digest. But I think I've prosecuted my case before my employers, the people of Kenya. And I trust because the members of Parliament are also listening. They'll be fair. They'll be just and they'll be true to their conscience and do the right thing and not hang an innocent man without evidence. I wouldn't mind being crucified if there was evidence, but there's nothing, nothing, zero. I've explained myself to the fullest. And I think you and the people of Kenya have heard me. Let me thank all of you for giving me this time and appreciate the media for your role to inform the people of Kenya, to educate them, to entertain them, and keep them abreast with what is going on. I want to thank you for your coverage of the short public uh, participation on this impeachment motion because you exposed it for what it was. 
and your video clips are very useful for us as we argue in courts of law. You guys are wonderful. <laughs> you are good people. No wonder you are called the fourth estate. I don't know where we would go in this country without you. We would have so much impunity. We would go back to dictatorship without the media. I want to encourage you to be continue to be the watchdog on behalf of the people of Kenya to protect the constitution with zeal, to uphold the rule of law, and to call out impunity and corruption. And I want to say after this impeachment, I want the members of parliament now to focus on the corruption scandals around our country. They are Dani scandal. The issues in public health sector, the glaring theft of public resources. That is what Parliament should consider and take time. And that is what the people of Kenya want. And I really want to thank the media for being a very responsible watchdog on behalf of the people of Kenya. Please continue writing. Where Rigadi Gashagwa has gone wrong, please write. But always accord me the right of reply. Don't condemn me unheard. And I want to thank you tonight. Because you have really written accusations against me. But I am also to blame because I never called you, isn't it? Now that I have called you, I want you to request you. Every accusation, put my answer. Is that not fair? Let the people of Kenya judge. You want to ask questions? Yes. yes. But not outside this. Okay. Um, Your Excellency, thank you. We appreciate uh, you hosting us here. You have said a lot in the last uh, more than one, nearly two hours, so I'll be very brief in relation to what you said. Um, my colleague Sam Gitoko hosted you here on the 20th of September, and you said a motion of such magnitude cannot head to Parliament without the sanctioning of the party at the parliamentary group level and without the go-ahead or the green lighting by the president, has President William Ruto, in effect, sanctioned that motion now that it's in parliament? Second, this is in relation to your statement on the 4th of January this year regarding High Court Judge Honorable Esther Maina you have mentioned. You said you're accused of corruption, and you said you'll file a petition, but we never saw you there. You nonetheless said that you have filed a petition. Can you tell the Kenyan people when you have filed that petition? Maybe you can not. Um, this one the same because, uh, Your Excellency, you and President William Ruto hold the ultimate office that must provide answers for the Kenyan people. You therefore are open to accountability, scrutiny, and questions. When you took your oath of office, you told the Kenyan people that the country has empty coffers, that you inherited empty coffers. However, your statement is contrary to what the Kenyan National Bureau of Statistics says, that at the time when you assumed office, the country had at its disposal 3.02 trillion Kenya shillings, includes revenue plus appropriations in aid. Why, Mr. Deputy President, did you make such a misleading statement in front of the Kenyan people and the world? Regarding your shareholding question, I'm sorry to say you, I'm sorry to hold you to account, Mr. Deputy President, that the context in which you have provided um, the agreement between the parties, the Kenya Kwanzaa parties, and your defense is different. This is what you said in Kericho County, that this government on, 4th, on February 2023, this government is a company, you told the people, that has its shares. They are owners who have the majority of shares and those who just have a few, while others do not have any. You invested in this government, you told the people of Kericho County, so you must trip. You sought, you tilted, you tilled, you put manure and irrigated. Now it's your time to rip. Some few months later, the High Court quashed the appointment of more than 1,406 KRA officials. And the judgment? 700 of those officials were either from the Kalenjin or the Kikuyu community. How much of a responsibility will you take, being part of the presidency, of such gross locking out of Kenyans who are qualify, who are competent, who merit, yet half of those appointments went to only two communities? 
That's enough. Thank you. Uh, one, the issue of uh, justice minor is subjudice. I don't want to discuss it because it's a matter before court, but I'll be able to give you the date when we file so that you can follow the petition. As to the issues that this motion cannot find its way to the assembly without the president nod, that is true. It can't. Uh, it has its nod. Um, as to the issue of shareholding, again, this is a matter that I will be prosecuting. So, 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 uh, by 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 answering your question, I, I, I will delve into the merits and the demerits of the argument that will come up. But I also want to remind you that uh, I did not say that it's a company. I said like a company, like you look at the clip is there, like I gave an example, and. A company has shareholders. I've just read to you the starter percent here for somebody. That's what I was saying. I was just being truthful without uh, removing the removing the um, the agreement. Again, uh, I am not responsible for making appointments in Kenya. I don't make any appointments. The deputy president has not appointed anybody. You know the appointing authority. Ladies and gentlemen, because uh, my lawyers tell me we don't want to delve into the merits and the demerits of the presentation that I've made. Yes, Karanja. From uh, NTV. Your Excellency, when you apologized to President Uhuru Kenyatta, you said that the words used then were out of political reasons. And that's why you are apologizing. So why should Kenyans believe you today that what you're saying is not for political reasons, for your own immediate benefit? My second question, uh, Your Excellency. What next uh, if this impeachment happens tomorrow? If you're impeached, what next for you? If you're not impeached, then what next in this political marriage between you and President William Ruto? Let's say your answer is what I've discussed here are facts. It's for the people of Kenya to look at the facts and decide whether they have the necessary veracity or not. As to what I'll do or not what I'll do, let's cross the bridge when we get there. I think, uh, I think uh, good people, we have had a long night. Uh, we have had a very long night, and you need to go and file your story. I want to once more thank you very much, good people. Asante Nisana, Mungu Abariki, Tutaunana Kesh. Thank you.